University of Newton's Association. Really needs your membership and hope you will consider giving to the SUAA Legal Action Fund. We have Linda Brookhart here today, who's our executive director. And we will make sure that if you want information about that, we provide it. Um, another thing to tell people, watch, this has nothing to do with the pension, just telling you what's happening. Watch for health insurance, although it will be still free now for, we hope, for the primary dependent. Of course, you will, you will pay for your dependent if you have one. Um, annually, there will be new things you can choose, and watch very carefully for all of those. Um, I'm a cynic, and I also do numbers, so I know if they're not collecting our 2% or 4%, um, I'm guessing that the quality and the co-pays uh, are going to be affected. So, and you know, we have health insurance, it doesn't say how much and how good it's going to be. So you're going to have to look very carefully at what you choose. I must say, I feel like the Queen saying, look very carefully at this, as she said about Scotland. And we know how democracy and referendum can go. Remember, you do vote and you do think, so take that into account. A couple of announcements of things upcoming. Um, President Easter will be at UIC on October 6th, sponsored by APAC. And I think they have to register, and I haven't yet, so I should. And I think that's here. Is it Mike? Um, and he'll be talking about anything and answering questions. A lot of chaos going on at the university level. I believe because of the fiscal constraints that it's desperately affecting senior leadership and our faculty. And of course, tuition has gone up because the money has been cut from state um, higher education and you still have to make payroll. So, it's, it's now on the backs of students, tuition almost, and donors almost entirely. Um, one more meeting for you to note down. Post-election, Dick Simpson will again be talking to our group at lunchtime with a brown bag, and that's November 20th on Thursday. And um, I'm going to step down in a second, but this is the part where I can enjoy thanking the people who have put the program together today. Um, I have Deb and Karen, Karen is just there, Deb's probably still outside. They organize uh, the meeting here, make sure everything is set up, and there will be a lunch afterwards for those who can stay, sort of finger foods. Um, I want to thank uh, Jim Limba, who is doing the webcasting, and it's uh, it's amazing what our retired people do as a service to the university, and we're greatly indebted to Jim for coming and doing that. And finally, um, the moderator today, and the person who did all the invitations and putting the program together and making it all happen, is Meryl Gassman. Um, Meryl is the past president of uh, the UIC chapter of SUAA, and he's Professor Emeritus of Biology. And he also is the one that keeps the active list serve that sends to the, the SUA, UIC members and other SUAA friends from other chapters. So if you want to be added to that, uh, it's a really, he runs a really good website and, and list serve. So with that, I shall pass it over to you. Thank you, Brenda. Good morning, everybody. As you just heard, the enormous unfunded public pension liability that the state of Illinois has accumulated over the years continues to grow and is now estimated to be near $100 billion. That ain't small change. In addition, no inroads have been made in reducing the state's structural deficit. At the end of August 2014, the Illinois Office of the Comptroller reports an estimated bill backlog near $5.2 billion, an increase of more than $2.2 billion 
since the end of July. How will the state deal with these financial challenges? The likely loss of the anticipated savings from the demise of both the pension reform law and the health insurance law will only compound the problem going forward. What can the state do now? Extend the temporary income tax increase? Levy new taxes? Cut expenses? Implement a combination of these. To address these issues, we have three distinguished experts in state finance. Let's hear what they have to say. Each of our panelists will make an initial presentation of up to 15 minutes. They will subsequently have an opportunity to make a follow-up statement. For those of you in our audience who wish to pose questions of them, we will pass out and collect index cards for the question and answer portion of the program. If you are watching us on the web, you may submit questions to me via Twitter at UICSUAA, or you may email me sua at uic.edu, and I'll get those. Our first panelist is Amanda Cass, who is the research director at the Center <coughs> for Taxes and Budget Accountability, with subspecialties in pensions, public housing, and fiscal analysis. Her work focuses on understanding the broad connections between disparate aspects of public policy across different scales, national, state, and local. She's also responsible for CTBA's infographics and mapping and provides support to many of CTBA's cross-discipline projects. Since joining CTBA, Amanda has served on the advisory board for the IMN Midwest Public Funds Summit, the Steering Committee for Participatory Budgeting Chicago, and represents the organization with the media and the public. In addition to her responsibilities for CTBA, Amanda is pursuing a PhD in Urban Planning and Policy at UIC. Her doctoral research focuses on public housing. Amanda graduated from Ohio State University with a BA in Geography and International Studies. She also holds an MA in Geography from the University of Colorado at Boulder. Her master's thesis focused on post-earthquake reconstruction efforts in Haiti, which underscored the importance of fiscal policy in ensuring the public sector has the capacity to deliver crucial services. Amanda Cass. I'm up. Well set. I should say, I want to asterisk, I haven't started my PhD research yet. Just if anybody is in the IRB office, I have not started it. Um, so thank you so much for having me be part of this panel today. Um, and I, I'm going to build a little bit off of what Brenda and Meryl have already said. And I kind of want to start my comments out not talking about Illinois, but about how pensions are being discussed in general because we're really talking about it, I think, in the wrong way. And not just in Illinois, but I see this kind of as a national trend. And we're assuming that benefits are too expensive and need to be cut. And kind of this framing of the discussion then dictates the policy solutions that come about. So Senate Bill 1, for example. And the first question we really need to be asking is, are benefits the core driver of the unfunded pension liabilities? And in many instances, and this is really especially true in Illinois, the answer is a resounding no. It's really a debt problem. It's not a benefit problem. It just happens to be debt owed to the retirement systems. So for example, out of every $1 that the state pays to the state university's retirement system, 70 cents is going to the debt, the unfunded liabilities. And only about 30 cents is the cost of benefits. And until we talk about it as a debt problem, and until we also take on why that debt problem kind of arose in the first place, which in Illinois is because of our flat, flawed revenue system, and kind of decisions over the years to underfund the pensions, we're just going to continue to see headlines about pension crises and legislation that cuts benefits. So this inability to fix our revenue system, it creates numerous problems, right? It's not just the unfunded pension liabilities, but it's also the cuts to the core services of public safety, health care, K-12, 
through 12 education, and as I'm sure kind of everybody in this room is aware of, the cuts that have gone on to higher education. And I wanted to bring it up um, because it's not just a problem in media coverage or legislative debate, but I've also seen it in the work of academics and think tanks. And since we're at USC, I thought it would be a really kind of good forum to talk about it. Um, when I was getting ready for preparing what I was going to say, Meryl forwarded me a recent publication from the Brookings Institution and a professor from political science at Drew University. And I kind of read it, and the more I read it, the kind of more frustrated I got about it. Uh, it's because the paper traces the politics of pension legislation in four states, including Rhode Island, New Jersey, and Illinois, which is you. Um, and it uses the four states to draw some recommendations for policymakers in other states about how to successfully enact pension reform. And I find it a kind of perfect example of how benefits are the implied problem of large unfunded liabilities and fiscal woes across the country. Throughout the report, the author uses the term pension reform, and he justifies this usage, and he specifically states that, quote, pension systems in many states have simply become unsustainable, and that significant changes are necessary. And, you know, he kind of acknowledges in it that the problem of the unfunded liabilities was caused not by benefits, but by governments not putting what's required into the pension systems. Despite that, though, the examples he uses where pension reform has been successful is all states that have enacted recent legislation that severely cuts benefits. And so I think we really need to recognize that the phrase pension reform is really just a way to say that pension benefits need to be cut. And again, this really misses the point because benefits are not the driver of the unfunded liabilities. Instead, it's the debt owed to the retirement systems. And it's the result of policy and political decisions over decades um, to not deal with raising revenue. So when the policy solution is just to cut benefits, we really also, I think, skirt another important issue of what is retirement security and what is an appropriate amount for our aging population to be able to live on. We also ignore how cutting pension benefits may just create increased costs in other areas of our state and local budgets. Um, because we might be creating a class of our senior citizens who are going to become more reliant on social programs. I think, moreover, how is it that if not paying into the pension systems created the problem, cutting the benefits is formulated as the solution? And we also aren't asking, well, why have states underfunded the pension systems in the first place? Because, again, the problem is being presented as pension benefits. And because of that, our tax system is not being discussed. And when we don't discuss it, it becomes a third rail issue. And it impairs our ability to fund core services that citizens demand. In the case of Illinois, unfunded pension liabilities are a symptom of the larger problem. The state's fiscal imbalance caused by a poorly designed tax system. Because of the tax system, the state does not take in enough revenue each year to cover the cost of services from year to year. So to paper over this for decades, uh, between the cost of services and revenue, decision makers from kind of both sides diverted money from the pension systems instead to pay for these services. And so while this allowed us to kind of avoid dealing with our tax policy, it created a very, very large amount of debt that seems to continuously be growing. So the borrowing led the unfunded liabilities to really balloon in a short time period. From 1989 through 1994, the unfunded liability for the five state pension systems nearly doubled. And then in 1995, we got the wonderful pension ramp. So, it, you know, that was presented at the time as this 50-year plan that was going to pay back what was owed to the retirement systems and start properly funding the systems. Pension ramp, though, I think, as we're kind of aware now, was flawed in a couple of different ways. First was it actually continued the practice of severely underfunding the pension systems for 15 years. So by law, from 1996 through 2010, what the state was putting into the retirement system, it wasn't based on the cost of benefits, let alone an amount of money to pay back what was already owed. Um, instead, it was this kind of schedule to incrementally increase the contributions from year to year, so that by 2011, the contribution was sufficient enough to start paying back the debt. And by the end of 2045, each of the five systems would be 90% funded. Well, kind of what happened over those 15 years? One is that by design, the unfunded liabilities 
we kind of pile on the effects of the recession and a couple of different things that ha happened during the Bukoyoch administration, and we get to 2011. So second, the other way kind of the pension ramp was really flawed is that it created a backloaded repayment schedule. So from 2011 through 2045, by design in the pension ramp, the state's contributions was, have to, was going to have to increase significantly from year to year. And again, what, what didn't we address in 1995, though? The actual root of the problem, the, well, the state's flawed tax system. So, you know, unsurprisingly, pensions were still a problem. In 2010, uh, we created the second benefit tier rate, which severely cut benefits for new hires, which I know is kind of an especially big problem here at the universities. Um, you know, and even though that benefits severely, a severe cut from the tier one benefit, we still didn't solve the problem. So then you fast forward to past November when I had the good fun of over Thanksgiving analyzing Senate Bill 1, um, right? And it cuts benefits again significantly, but this time for current employees and retirees. And I appreciate that it also tries to repay the debt owed to the retirement systems in 30 years and tries to repay all of it. And this is something that actuaries really, really want. It's, it's really unattainable. And the backloaded repayment plan that's kind of one of the hallmarks of the pension ramp is left in place. So even if Senate Bill 1 is found constitutional, which I really strongly don't think it will be, uh, we're, I think, going to still continue to see headlines about pension crises. And again, it's because Senate Bill 1 is designed to address a pension problem, and Illinois doesn't have a pension problem. We have a debt problem. So studies have shown that pensions in Illinois, uh, when taking into account the fact that it's a supplement for Social Security, are not really generous, and they're actually in line um, with national public pensions across the country. And, you know, in fact, I was just looking through some of my stuff today, and the Pension Modernization Task Force from 2009 studied the very question of, are benefits in Illinois overly generous? And it was a resounding, no, they're not. Instead, again, we've got this debt problem, and it just happens to be the debt that's owed to the pension systems and not to a third-party kind of bondholder. And I just want to highlight some numbers about how I think even if Senate Bill 1 is found constitutional, we're going to continue to see pension crises. So for 2016, because of the income tax rates for both corporate and personal income tax are going to decline, we're going to have about $5 billion less in revenue. Senate Bill 1 cuts the state's pension contribution by about a billion dollars. So, you know, simple math there, five billion less revenue, only a billion dollar cut in the pension contribution, something else is gonna have to give. Moreover, Senate Bill 1 only reduces the state's pension contribution for, from 2015 to 2016. If we look forward to 2017, it's an increase. And in fact, the pension contribution has to increase every single year over the next 20 years. So again, we've left this backloaded repayment schedule in place and Ever, inc ever increasing pension contributions was kind of precisely one of the reasons why Senate Bill 1 was arguing in the first place is ne so necessary. So to ameliorate the fiscal pressure, um, my organization, CTBA, has been arguing for a number of years about putting in place a new repayment plan. So this backloaded schedule that's in, um, that was a hallmark of the pension ramp and is still in place, is, it's basically akin to a balloon mortgage. And what we've kind of modeled out a number of different ways is putting in place um, a, something that's akin to having like a traditional mortgage. In this level dollar repayment structure though, in the short term, it requires the state to put more money into the pension systems as compared to the backloaded schedule. And because of that, um, because of that, you know, this kind of rational redesign of how we pay the debt over the retirement systems is seen as unattainable. So we've also suggested ways to remedy the larger problem, the tax problem. Um, it's included expanding sales tax to cover services, as well as switching to a graduated income tax. Without fixing our revenue system and without also re-amortizing the debt owed to the pension systems, we're going to see cuts, I think, to four core areas of education, K-12 and higher ed, healthcare, human services, and public safety, and the multiple billions of dollars. That's it for me. Thank you very much. We'll move on to our next panelist, Daniel Biss. Daniel represented the 17th District in the Illinois House for two years before his election to the State Senate in 2012. He resides in Evanston, Illinois, and serves the 9th Senatorial District in North Suburban Chicago. 
This grew up in Bloomington, Indiana, and moved to Chicago after completing a BA at Harvard University and a PhD in mathematics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. At the age of 25, he joined the University of Chicago's mathematics faculty. You beat me, Dan. I think I was about 27 when I As a legislator, Biss has been very active in pension matters. During his term in the House, Biss served as co-chair of a bipartisan working group, exploring solutions to the state's pension crisis. In the Senate last year, he served with Senator Brady on the Joint Conference Committee, whose work resulted in the drafting of the pension bill, SB1. Biss was appointed in 2013 to chair the state's Digital Divide Elimination Advisory Committee, which evaluated strategies to help more Illinoisans access critical resources through the internet. He is a member of several Senate committees, including Licensed Activities and Pensions, Education, Higher Education, Environment, and Local Government. Senator Biss. Uh, thank you very much, and thanks to both Marilyn and Brenda for the invitation and the chance to be with you today. Um, I, I think by the nature of the structure, I'm asked to give kind of an independent, standalone, uh, developed in a silo opening set of comments, and then we can kind of interact later, but I'm not going to do that. Um, I, I, I think that, that Amanda, who I as always agree with about almost exactly half of what she says, um, I think she made really important organizing points about how to think about this question of our pension debt in the context of our fiscal challenges. And I think those are important, those are, those are properly situated as corrections in how we, how we have this conversation. So, and the word that got me, actually, in that report that you read from is this word unsustainable, which I think even more than reform is really wielded like a bludgeon. Uh, people always say those benefits are just unsustainable, and then you're not supposed to be allowed to respond. Uh, I think that actually means a really specific thing, which is that in the private sector, defined benefits were not sustained. Uh, and that's mostly true um, and noteworthy, but, but I think is noteworthy in complicated ways. Like, for example, it's noteworthy because they were regulated in a totally different way than public sector pensions are regulated today, in some ways better and in some ways worse. Uh, but it's also noteworthy in that the conversation tends to end there. In other words, private employers did not sustain their defined benefit pensions. And what we don't, don't then do is have a critical discussion of what happened next. But what happened next is, is certainly no um, panacea either. And so we've, we've had now a uh, many decade long experiment essentially in the private sector that I would say is more a failure than a success. Uh, so that's a big conversation, a long conversation, but I think worth noting that when people say traditional pensions are unsustainable, what they then don't say is the model we replaced them with results in a different unsustainable phenomenon. It's just that what's unsustainable is expressed differently. Because what happens across these systems is that those of us who are responsible for making decisions about putting money away for retirement have a habit of not putting enough money away for retirement. And if you fail to put enough money away when you're a government running a defined benefit pension system, that gets expressed as a broke government because the benefit is defined by formula and you've got to make up the money somehow. If you're a worker who has not put enough money away in their retirement account, that gets expressed as a senior living in poverty because there's no safety net. But neither one is a good outcome. And so I think we need to kind of understand that when people describe that one is unsustainable, it, usually they're implying the other is a good alternative and that's just incorrect if recent US economic history is to be believed. The other point that Amanda makes that I, I think is really, really important is that we just need to be honest about distinguishing between uh, already accrued costs, which are, again, expressed as debt, expressed as that $100 billion number, and going forward costs and benefits to be accrued. And 
this is the discussion that begins to distinguish Illinois because there's a nationwide huge amount of noise around pensions and pension reform and pension debt, all this stuff. Uh, but each state is different. Each state's practices have been different. Each state's experiences for the last generations have been different. And so each state is in a different position. Illinois, I'm sorry to tell you, is in, uh, by most measures, the worst position. Uh, and so there are other states that are having this discussion where what they really ought to be talking about as the primary question is what's the value of the benefits to be accrued tomorrow? Because the benefits accrued yesterday are more or less paid for. That's just not the case in Illinois. So we can have a discussion about what the appropriate value of the benefits to be accrued tomorrow is. It's a really important policy question, an important fiscal question. But it's not the driver of the headlines. The driver of the headlines is that $100 billion number. And that $100 billion number is a debt, which is to say it's a difference between what has been uh, promised and what has been set aside. Uh, I know that most of you know this, but just to be technical, that's for the state pension systems, that's SURS, but also the TRS, which is for the teachers outside of Chicago Public Schools, uh, the state employees themselves, legislators and judges. I think, and I don't want to make this all about again, I think this is where we start to differ in our point of view. I, I think it is, it is just fact that that's $100 billion of debt. It's a gap between promises made and funds set aside. It's not the fault of the employees who just went to work. Uh, it's mostly the fault of the legislature, which sometimes just skipped payments because it was convenient politically and sometimes put in place irresponsible payment plans. It's also, in large part, the fault of uh, financial market circumstance and a variety of other circumstances as well. But the, the question that is, what do you do to fill that $100 billion hole? Merrill mentioned some scary kind of local in time statistics about what our debt, our backlog of bills have done in the last few weeks or even months. That exists against an encouraging backdrop of statistics over a longer period of years during which the unpaid bill backlog was cut more or less in half from, from very close to $10 million to under half of that. Um, and that happened not by magic, but by a big tax increase followed by a huge number of cuts. Cuts, of course, to higher education, uh, but also kind of very typical ahistoric cuts to K-12 education, human services, big Medicaid uh, reform package, and the like. Um, what happened in the last few months is that we entered the fiscal year that began July 1st, whose budget was prepared by a legislature that was waiting for an election. And this path of uh, continued passage of the combination of a tax plan and a spending plan that brings in more than you put out so as to enable the paying down of debt stopped. Uh, I think the Senate would say because you know we were scared to do it before the election. I think a more positive spin might be that there's a gubernatorial race happening right now, which. Uh, some might view as a de facto referendum on this question and could be hopefully used as input as the legislature comes back after the election and tries to dig our way back out of this new hole we've created. Uh, but the bottom line is that the, the only way out of this problem is to, to, over time, decrease what has to go out the door and or increase what's going to come in the door. And the aggregate of those two activities, the former decrease and the latter increase, has to be enough to over time cover up the debt. Um, The discretionary areas of the budget have been hit really hard, I have to tell you. Um, I, I, there's a lot to say about the way we fund elementary and secondary education, but if you had told people six years ago that we would cut a billion dollars out of state aid to public K through 12 schools, uh, I don't think people would have believed it, frankly. It was just so unlike what legislatures typically did in response to fiscal problems. Uh, the human service cuts have been very deep, the Medicaid cuts have been awful. You guys know probably more about the hiring cuts than I do, but I know enough. Uh, and anyone who's experiencing the process of helping kids figure out how to think about college knows plenty about the consequences of that as well. Um, the income tax 
tax increase of the beginning of 2011 was the biggest single step that was taken um, on this front. And the majority of it is scheduled to go away on January 1st. Um, if you were to assume the current law is going to just be allowed to operate without any uh, modifications, what you'd find is that it wouldn't be more than a year, year and a half before we're kind of back at the worst case that we've been in in, in recent years, say in 2009 10. Um, the question is going to be very simple what, what shall be done? Uh, there's a lot of energy around an effort uh, that I know CTPA has been supportive of, and I was certainly supportive of, to amend the Constitution to remove the flat tax provision. That failed. So we were not successful in putting that referendum on the ballot. So the Constitution is currently mandates a flat income tax and will continue to after this election. So the question becomes, what's the, what are the tools at our disposal to address the tax question in a way that's, uh, that's meaningful? The, the governor's proposal last spring was simply to make the 5% income tax rate permanent, uh, to kind of use part of that money to pay for some enhanced property tax relief, uh, his opponent uh, is pushing for a certain broadening of the sales tax base. Uh, there's also the, the opportunity to make some steps on the corporate tax code. There's some particular loopholes that people have interest in. The number of variables before us is very, fairly small, and the, and the size of the debt problem is still pretty real. Um, so, what I think needs to happen is that the state, the legislature needs to come back after the election, uh, hopefully with Governor-elect Quinn, and uh, work out. This is, of course, a nonpartisan forum. I'm just speaking <laughs> as a private citizen. Uh, the legislature needs to come in after the election with the next, with the person who will be inaugurated as governor in early 2015, whoever that may be, and work out an arrangement on revenue. I think the goals of that should be to have a better, fairer, more economically efficient tax code. And I think realistically, a tax code that will bring in an amount of revenue that's kind of fairly comparable to what's been brought in after the income tax increase. In other words, I don't think allowing a big, a big drop in revenue when you still have a big debt problem is sensible. At the same time, I don't think a big new increase in revenue is, is um, going to be plausible either, given the, 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 the appetite in the legislature for even retaining what we have. Uh, and that's going to leave us with more challenges. Now, we're going to have to continue to be disciplined on discretionary spending. I wish I could say that that's going to allow us to kind of uh, undo two decades of higher education cuts and, and other, other painful things that have happened. I, I don't think we're on that trajectory now. I think we're on a trajectory where we're going to need continued discipline on discretionary spending. Though I don't think continued cuts uh, should, be, should be part of the, the, the recipe. Um, and then the other giant question is the is the question about the court's uh, ruling on the pension law. Um, I think Brenda described it really well. The pension clause says the membership in a retirement system is a contractual relationship, the benefits of which shall not be diminished or impaired. There's two different categories of question about that. One is how much stuff is covered by that contractual relationship, and the other is how deep does that coverage go. On July 3rd, with the Canary decision, we, we uh, got a surprising answer to that former question, frankly. Um, whether you liked Senate Bill 1313 or didn't, uh, I think most people didn't expect it to be overturned, but it was, which told us that the Supreme Court incorporates the uh, retiree health benefits into that what question. That much is, that's part of the what which is covered by the pension clause of the Illinois Constitution. And, and then when the Senate Bill 1 is uh, ruled upon, we'll find out something about the depth of that coverage, whether the concept of some sort of uh, state emergency power allows for some flexibility. And I, I um, spent a lot of time talking with people who were certain that Senate Bill 1 was going to be upheld, and a lot of time talking with people who were certain it was going to be overturned. And now I've spent a lot of time talking with people who are certain that because of the Canary decision it's going to be overturned, and a lot of time talking with people who claim to be certain that the Canary decision is irrelevant. Uh, though sometimes they look kind of nervous when they say that. Um, I am not qualified to make those predictions, uh, and I won't make those predictions, but I think we need to acknowledge that a variety of outcomes are possible, and the, the range
range of consequences for the state's fiscal position is meaningful. So we'll do whatever we do on revenue. We'll pass whatever budget we can pass in the spring of 2015. I hope that both of those decisions will be uh, as fair as possible, but also responsible from the point of view of understanding we're still shouldering a lot of debt. Then we're going to learn more about our fiscal position from the courts and, and move on uh, from there. Um, I think the other thing to be said about the court decision is that the way the law is structured, they don't need to give a one syllable yes or yes or no. They might give a large amount of guidance. They, there are certainly some who say that, hey, after Panera, they're definitely going to say all oh, this is totally unconstitutional. You guys are ready to just go away. They may do that. It's entirely possible. But they may not. They may, they may give a roadmap for what sorts of changes are possible. They may say that certain changes are justified and others are not. They may talk about the justification and critique the justification but explain what sorts of justification might be possible. So I do think it's important to wait and see what's said and, and, and respond to it and try to build the best, the best outcome as we can. And I think that whatever we're told by the courts, whatever we do on taxes, whatever we do on discretionary spending, um, we need to put in place and adhere to an actuarially responsible funding schedule. We have to fund what we're going to pay out. We have to fund what we're going to pay out. We, we have to, like, yes, I mean, we have to be realistic about what we can do. We shouldn't pretend to do something impossible because that would be a lie, which would get us into more trouble rather than less. But we, if, if we don't decide that it's possible to set and adhere to an actuarially responsible funding schedule for our pensions, then your grandchildren and mine will be having this exact same discussion. And so you know, I think that needs to be the bedrock tenet from which everything else flows as we navigate these difficult times and try to craft a solution that works. Thanks. Thank you, Senator. We'll move on to our last panelist, Senator Bill Brady. Bill Brady a resident of Bloomington, Illinois, that is, has served as senator in the 44th district since May 2002, previously serving as state representative for the 88th district from 1993 to 2001. Both districts are located in central Illinois, for those of us who are from the northeastern part. Uh, during his tenure as a legislator, he has worked to increase education accountability and funding and sponsored reforms of workers' compensation and medical malpractice laws. He has championed reforms in the state's insurance and financial industries that became a national model and sponsored laws that promote highway safety through more training for young drivers. Senator Brady was named Assistant Senate Republican Leader in February 2011. He is the ranking Republican for the Senate Insurance Committee and a member of the Agriculture and Conservation, Environment, State Government and Veterans Affairs, and Transportation Committees. He serves on the Audit Commission and on the American Legislative Exchange Council. He is a board member of the Illinois Comprehensive Health Insurance Plan, ICHIP. And like Senator Biss, he served in 2013 on the Joint Conference Committee on Pensions, whose work resulted in the drafting of SB1. In 2010, Senator Brady was the Republican candidate for governor. Bill Brady was born in Bloomington, Illinois, and graduated from Illinois Wesleyan University. Over the course of his professional career, he has founded and operated several businesses, mostly focused in the areas of housing development and marketing. He is a member of the local, state, and national associations of realtors and the McLean County Chamber of Commerce. He has served as a member of the boards of numerous civic, charitable, and community-based organizations. Senator Brady. Well, uh, thank you for those um, opening remarks. I'll try to keep my remarks shorter than your introduction of me for the benefit of the audience. Uh, it is good to be here, and thank you for having us here, speaking for Senator Biss and myself. We're glad to be here. I just want you to know that having been involved in Senate Bill 1, the only way we were willing to show up is if there was no fruit to throw and you all kept your shoes on. Um, but in all seriousness, I, 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 there's several things that we all agree on. 
And there are several things that we differ on. But one of the things that we agree on is that the people who've earned a right to a retirement with the state of Illinois deserve to have the security of knowing that that retirement is funded. Uh, for over two decades, I have been talking to anybody who would listen about the pinchous crisis that was looming if we failed to react responsibly. Uh, back then, when I brought it up, people's eyes glazed over. No, there's no problem. You know, he's crying wolf. There's not going to be an issue here. But today we are sitting here with a pension system that is less than half funded and over $100 billion in unfunded liabilities. The reality that we need to deal with. You know, I often ask yourself a question, uh, why is government in debt? And the simple answer is because they can be. Unfortunately, when you leave it to politicians to make short-term decisions that help them get reelected, we look, we suffer from long-term consequences uh, that aren't good. And that's the situation that we've seen ourselves in. You know, when I helped craft, uh, helped craft the 95 legislation, which ramped up funding, we tried to put some teeth in it to guarantee the funding. Now, by the way, a little bit of trivia. Do you know who the only governor in history is to fully meet the pension obligations each and every year? Governor Ryan. Governor Ryan is the only governor who met the obligations each and every year of his tenure. Governors and legislatures over the course of history have chosen to give benefits to fund, to fund appropriations and ignore the requirement of the pensions. And that can't continue, but it will continue. When we passed the 95 legislation, we thought, what could we do to ensure that legislators and governors wouldn't enact budgets that didn't fund the pensions? You see, in the previous to that legislation, legislatures didn't affirmatively not fund the pensions. They just ignored the obligation and funded everything else. So we thought, well, well certainly, the people in the five systems would never allow a legislative body or a governor to enact a budget that said we will not fund the pensions. Which is why we put the language, the continuing resolution language in that said the pensions, pensions will be funded unless the legislature takes an affirmative action to say we will not fund them. And if they ever did that, certainly the annuitants in those five systems and the others would raise up in arms and say, never will you get reelected, and if you vote for that, we'll make sure. But what happened? We saw it happen repeatedly under Bogoyevich and others. Quinn, in some cases, borrowing rather than actually taking the money to fund, which just created a hole over here rather than here. And we're left with the situation we have today. Frankly, I have to tell you that I think the only long-term solution, I think Senator Biss and I would agree on this, is to move prospectively toward an employee-owned pension. Uh, something that's called uh, a defined contribution, where you own your own pension. And frankly, I was part of passing the legislation which allows university, university uh, annuitants or employees to exercise that option. Those systems are fully funded. And that annuitant knows they can take that with them, buy an annuity at the end of that. Now the real reason is not because defined benefits can't work, they can. And the real reason is not because a defined benefit is richer necessarily than a defined contribution, because they don't have to be, it's a matter of math. The real reason is you can't trust politicians to make the contribution on an annual basis to a defined benefit program. It's been proven. But do you think anyone in a pension system where it's a defined contribution with a match and the employer or the state doesn't make the match on an annualized basis will get reelected? I don't think so. Now the solution that we came up with was a solution that was required because if we don't do something, our pension funding requirements will go from approximately $7 billion to excess of $14 billion a year. Many would argue that's unsustainable. 
Time will only tell, depending on what we have. But the truth of the matter is we need teeth to require legislators and governors to no longer ignore the liabilities each and every year of the pension system and to pay off the backlog of unpaid, unfunded liabilities. Which is why, candidly speaking, my solution to the crisis was to honor what everybody has earned to date, but to say prospectively, your retirement growth will be in a defined contribution program where the state will match, and you will match, and you'll be able to buy an annuity with that money at the end of your career and live healthy. Really, there's no mathematical difference. The only difference is the state would be required to make that contribution on an annualized basis. That is what I firmly believe, after two decades of service, is the only real teeth we can put in law that will require prospective legislators and governors to do the right thing and meet the obligation. Now, I agreed and helped negotiate with Senator Biss the legislation we have in front of us that's in front of the Supreme Court. I think we were all taken back by the court's ruling on health insurance. I think that leaves more questions in our mind about whether or not this will be. I've been one who said the Supreme Court should move quickly on this and not wait till 2016 because the crisis simply gets worse as we ignore it. And so I'm hopeful that maybe we can nudge the court along to make a decision so we all know what the future holds uh, rather than postponing. Uh, that decision. Where somewhat we disagree is how do you how do you make sure that you have enough revenues to run a good government and to be in a good state? And where some would say we need to increase taxes, others would say, including myself, that we need to increase employment. Uh, from the all-time high of employment in the state of Illinois, we are still down over 200,000 jobs. Those 200,000 people who don't have a job are using state resources, which costs the state budget. Not to mention the fact that they're not bringing revenue into the state because they don't have a job, they're not paying taxes. And I think we need to do more to enhance the greatness that Illinois holds in terms of the opportunity to create jobs. And we can't do that by raising the tax rate. We know that when we raised the tax rate last time, we saw a huge outmigration. We know that Illinois is one of the largest outmigration states in the nation, which is just the same reason I oppose implementing an income tax on retirement. There are some in Springfield who will say, well, we couldn't do this, so we're going to have to tax uh, retirement income in Illinois and to be able to do it. I don't believe that works because a funny thing about tax policy, particularly most retirees, they seem to find a way to move across the border into another state that doesn't charge them for that. So that's not a solution either. So we need to do everything we can to foster our economic opportunities in the state, and they are vast. We're one of the greatest states in the nation in terms of opportunity. And if we put the people back to work, we can raise revenue, reduce expenditures, balance our budget, meet our obligations. But I have to tell you, and just closing and opening remarks, I don't think that there's any law we can pass that will ever force a General Assembly or a governor to do the right thing and fund the state's pension contributions in the future under a defined benefit program. And that's the biggest reason I support moving prospectively to a defined contribution uh, program uh, that helps secure the retirement interests of the people who work for our state. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Senator. Uh, we'll move back to our first panelist. We'll, we'll be given an opportunity to respond or make some additional can remarks. Can, can we pass out the cards so we can do the questions? Yes, yeah, yeah. so if you'd like an uh, index card for questions, please raise your hand. We'll get one to you. And if you have one ready to be collected, also raise your hand. Would you like to? Sure. Um, so I think, I guess I want to kind of focus on this question of converting from the defined benefit to defined contribution system. Because I think there's a number of different issues that that poses. So the first, right, is, is that question that I brought up of what is retirement security? And I think we can ask, does a defined contribution system provide retirement security? Um, the Center for Retirement Research, which is at Boston University, 
just came out with this really great study um, about 401k and IRA holdings in 2013, right? And it looked at the average household holding in 401ks and IRAs, which are defined contribution systems. What it found is that the average holding, and this was really a kind of unexpected finding, found that it fell from 2010 to 2013 for the age bracket that is closest to retirement. Moreover, the kind of typical household had a holding of about $110,000. And just reading from the conclusion, right, it says that that will provide at most about $500 a month. So those people, though, luckily, right, are coordinated with Social Security. Most people in the state pension systems are not. So the question then is, are we going to also coordinate with, retire with Social Security? If so, that's going to create an increased cost. Another thing I think is we need to think about the finances of the closed defined benefit system, right? So if you create a new system and you say, all right, all new hires are going to go into defined contribution system, that's future money that was supposed to go into our defined benefit system. And you create a cash flow problem. So you worsen the funding status of the closed defined benefit system, and then you in turn increase the state's contributions. So you potentially are going to worsen um, um, your problem. And then the last one is, you know, it's been touted around kind of that defined contribution systems are less expensive than defined benefit. Um, there's kind of a number of different studies showing that they're not necessarily less expensive. Some of the costs for the increased administrative fees are actually transferred to the participants, so for the current employees. And what happens is you pay for those increased administrative costs um, and it erodes your benefit, right? So instead of having one system in which the, all the money's pulled together and invested together, you're now all investors. And kind of who benefits from that? Uh, the portfolio managers. And so your fees go to that and the benefit gets eroded. So I think that's the big thing I just want to touch on is that I don't, um, I don't really think that's the solution. And I think it potentially creates our problem of the defined benefit even worse. Thank you. Senator Biss? Um, I don't want to give the impression of piling on because I, I do agree with Bill about a lot of things, but I, I do want to comment on that specific point because um, um, my, my name was, was mentioned. Um, I don't think that it's the right move for the state to to eliminate defined benefits and to move to a defined contribution system. Um, I have very strong feelings on why and how to design an optimal system. I think there are certain features of a defined contribution system, like the portability, that could be beneficial, but there are other features that are really problematic. Um, but 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 I the one specific thing I would well I guess the one other general thing I want to say in this is just to, to highlight the social security point. Um, Let's decide if we're gonna if we're gonna move to a defined contribution system for Illinois public employees. Today, uh, almost the only Illinois public employees who participate in Social Security are state employees and those who are in IMRF. Those are municipal government employees, kind of outside the city of Chicago and Cook County, essentially, but not public safety employees. So almost everybody else is in a pension in lieu of Social Security. And we had, a, I think, a pretty big national discussion in the spring of 2005 after President George W. Bush was re-elected about whether we want to view Social Security as indicative of a kind of a universal guaranteed right to a stream of income uh, after retirement until death, regardless of market forces or individual decisions. And I think the answer we came to is yes. And I, I personally feel like the concept of saying every American worker, except for the Illinois teacher, university professor, firefighter, and cop, right? Everybody else in America, whatever your job is, public or private, unless you work for a school, university, or in public safety in Illinois specifically, gets that guaranteed stream of income. That, that seems like not the direction I would hope that we want to go. And then we really have to be serious about what the cost and benefit of Social Security is and what the uh, impact on a worker of starting to pay into Social Security at an arbitrary point in their working life. I think it's a complex question. But 
but the main point I wanted to make after that long, another main point, um, is that with all respect, Senator, you, you told two narratives that went the exact opposite way. First, you said, hey, when we passed the ramp in 95, uh, we said, we're going to put this continuing appropriation into the law, and good Lord, if any legislator would come back thereafter and affirmatively change it, the workers and annuitants would rise up and they'd get voted out. And hey, we found out that wasn't true. And then you said, but if we went to a defined contribution system and the legislature didn't fund the match for the workers' accounts, then by God, the annuitants and workers would rise up and no one who voted for that would be reelected. I take, I think, simultaneously both a more cynical and a more hopeful view on, on the possibility of the legislature to do the right thing. I, I think that uh, we could do the wrong thing in any context, and we can be forced to, and we can force ourselves to do the right thing in a variety of contexts. And I, I, I think this question of what does it take to increase the chances of us doing the right thing, it's, I couldn't agree with you more. It's hugely important because we've screwed up so many times and we, we, we can't possibly expect to run a system properly if we don't pay. But I, I think that hoping that we can bake into the structure a kind of a political hammer that will force us to pay against our will and relies on the electorate rising up and voting us out if we do the wrong thing. I, I think that one's been disproven in the past and, and is probably inadequate to rely upon going forward, whether we're doing a defined benefit, defined contribution, or some other type of system. Well, thank you. First, I, I don't think they're inconsistent at all. Let me just ask the audience a question. In the past, when the legislature passed a budget, it appropriated money to the university system, which you worked for, but didn't, didn't fully fund the pension. How many of you called your legislator? Okay, now let me ask you another question. If you were in a defined contribution program, and you put in your $10,000, and the state was supposed to put in $5,000, and the state didn't put their $5,000 in, how many of you would call your legislator? I think more of you would. And, uh, and that's the motivation. Because people always rested on, well, we're constitutionally protected. It doesn't matter to me that it's un $100 billion unfunded. The government has to meet that obligation. And there may be a legitimate point to that. And as long as that happens, you've got politicians making short-term decisions with very severe long-term consequences. And my point is not that a benefit can't be as good in a defined benefit as a defined contribution. Mathematically, I think Senator Biss would agree with me, it can. Now, we've also talked about the fact that we've got a tier two system that doesn't work. And when we look at changing that, we're looking at a defined contribution that would be a cash balance. So to offset the argument that there's not a safety net like Social Security, we have taken great strides to look at defined contribution programs that do have a safety net. And it would give employees a better return on their money than if they were in Social Security based on the projections of Social Security and we had to take that money. So we can define a contribution program in such a way that there's a safety net that's better than Social Security and gives people a better opportunity for investment. The other point that was made is that if we move to a defined contribution, we'll starve cash. That's not right at all. That's only right if you believe the premise that you're not going to meet the current obligations of the pension system. And if we agree that we're going to meet the current obligations of the pension system, what we call the normal costs, then we have to make those payments. And I don't think there's anybody who doesn't believe we should meet normal costs each and every year. Then the question is, how do you pay the unfunded liability? Because the normal costs are the same for a defined contribution system as they are the current defined benefit, depending on the benefit you have. So there is no there is no crying that there's a cash flow crisis if you're going to have the integrity to fund both systems' normal costs properly. Thank you. Would any of the others like to make additional statements? Yes, Ms. Cannon. Um, I just wanted to comment because I think this issue of you know, the, the funding problem is a really, really good one to highlight. Um, and I would say that one of the good things that the 95 bill did is it did mandate that the state's pension contribution be a continuing appropriation. And it mandated that it be based on um, what was in state statute. And you know, I think that kind of people did see the underfunding of the pension systems, mostly with police and fire, and did try to do something about it. So we had the 
forget how long it ago was, but the IPPFA, which is the uh, Association for Police and Fire, they did, they filed a lawsuit about the underfunding of the pension systems. And the state Supreme Court ruled in that case exactly this, that it's the benefit that's protected, not a funding guarantee. So, you know, the question of how do you then create that funding enforcement mechanism is, is a real one. Um, if I and I think that's Bill's point. To be maybe maybe a different way to characterize Bill's point is that in a defined contribution system, that's not the case anymore. It's the the property of the worker, and that suit would conceivably be successful. Um, of course, the state of New Hampshire has a different solution to this. Their constitution, rather than guaranteeing the benefit level, guarantees the funding. The constitution, I think, basically says that every year the system shall certify to the legislature the cost, and the legislature shall appropriate the funds, and um, sure enough, they do. No other responses? Then we'll get to the question. Simply wish our Constitution said the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I have a variety of questions here. Some of them, some of them are uh, repetitive. Um, For Senator Brady, even when unemployment was at its lowest in Illinois, we seem to have revenue problems. Uh, do you believe that we have a structural deficit in Illinois where revenue hasn't kept up with inflation and the increase in costs? You know, I, Illinois right now is the 10th highest per capita tax in the state in the nation just in the state income tax. We also know we have one of the highest property tax burdens of any state in the nation. So the point here is how, how do you drive more revenue? And how do you balance your budget? Now, whether it's a structural deficit or whatever kind of deficit it is, it has to be dealt with. Um, I would say there's much more we can do to eliminate fraud, waste, and abuse in state government, particularly if you take a look at the Medicaid program in the state. Uh, it's, it's fraught with fraud and abuse, and its roles have grown so immensely that it is even a bigger burden than, than pensions, and now we spend more on Medicaid than we do on secondary and primary education. Uh, and so there are reprioritizations within that. But the other point is, how do you drive the most revenue? Uh, and I think Art Laffer, uh, gave us a great example during the Reagan years about you can increase tax rates to a point where they eventually diminish revenues. A 100% tax rate brings no revenue to government. A 0% tax rate brings no revenue to government. The question is, what is the appropriate mix to foster economic development and employment opportunities? And that's where I fall. I think our tax burden has become punitive and therefore has driven opportunities to other states. The evidence is clear. Single largest mi out migration state in the nation. We're the least growing state in the nation. We have 200,000 fewer jobs than we did in 2010. And that's clear. You, you don't have to do anything but compare us. So, how do we come up with? Now, do I think there's ways in which we need to raise more revenue? Uh, yeah, the primary one is we've got to stop tax avoidance. One of the areas that uh, we've lost a, a base of revenue is sales taxes. Many people are not meeting their tax obligations on sales taxes because they're not buying it from a source that collects it locally. And there's a lot of money that's left on the table there that would be fair to better implement the way to collect it. But I think we've got to realize that the way to raise revenues and cut expenditures is to give them more people employment opportunities. And it's a double win. Thank you. The next question is for Ms. Cass. How do you justify re-amortizing re I can't say re-amortizing re the pension payment and paying billions more in interest? How can legislators justify that to taxpayers? Well, I think it, I mean, so first of all, it depends on how you structure 
a reamortization. I mean, the reamortization is essentially just kind of refinancing your debt. And so, to not get too wonky, like I said, the what's in place right now requires the contributions to increase from year to year, and it's a backloaded system. So we don't begin, if we kind of assume simple one's unconstitutional for a second, we don't begin to pay down the unfunded liability under this backloaded system for decades. And that's because, by design, the state's contributions isn't enough to cover the normal cost, cost of benefits, and the interest <coughs> occurring every year. Right? So you can switch out, though, to a level dollar contribution, like I said. Um, level dollar puts more money in up front, so you slow down that kind of growth in the unfunded liability. What we kind of modeled out, one of the suggestions is to extend it beyond 30 years, beyond what an actuary wants to do. And you know that aspect of what should the time be, um, we can debate about, we can have discussions about, but I think switching right, from this backloaded system to one that is going to put more money in up front and if you design it right, save money in the long run is kind of a better way to do, and it would kind of slow the interest accruing on the unfunded liability. Thank you. The next question is for the two senators. Uh, assuming the pension bill is indeed found unconstitutional, in what way, specific ways, do you think the General Assembly will address the issue? First, under Governor Quinn, if re-elected. Second, if under Romer, if he is elected. Senator Bish, want to take the Democratic position first? The Quinn position. I think it'd be more fun if we both answered both. Don't you? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm okay with this. <laughs> um, and I, I guess maybe for the sake of ground rules, we should just assume that the court issues a strong, you know, thumbs down across the board to the yeah. Senate Bill One for this question. Um, I, I think that um, the. And the other thing to say, sorry, more ground rules, that something will have been done, at least under Governor Quinn, uh, to change the tax status quo before the court rules. Uh, you're right. I, th I think of Governor Quinn, I think regardless of who's elected, there'll be some action on taxes pretty soon because the, the precipitous drop in revenue in current law is, I think, I think even Rauner recognizes that the status quo is not going to work. So, so someone gets elected, something is done, on revenue, time elapses, the court, the system moves through the courts, and eventually the court, in, in, in its entirety, overturns Senate Bill 1. Um, I think under Governor Quinn, there would be a kind of variety of efforts from the various Democratic leaders to either push through some very, some modified version of, let's say, Senate Bill 2404, which itself uh, according to Canerva, wouldn't be upheld, but some some uh, version of which could conceivably be upheld. Let's say one that uh, it's not pandering. This is actual, but it's going to sound like pandering. Sorry, uh, one that doesn't involve retiree health care, but does involve the pensionable nature of future raises, and therefore applies only to active employees and not retirees. You know, it sounds like pandering. I'm sorry. It's just I would say the same thing to active employees. Um, so you could imagine an effort to, to push something like that through. You could imagine an effort to come back to the table with all the different employee groups uh, and negotiate some kind of deal with a potentially binding agreement not to sue. Um, or you could also, and I think that would depend a lot on what happens at the moment, what, what the fiscal picture looks like at the moment that that agreement would have to be struck. In other words, uh, if things are, if the bill backlog is continuing to drop and things are continuing to look manageable, maybe maybe there would even be some other avenue approach. But I think there would be an interest in trying to, to find some agreement that could be cobbled through that wouldn't wind up uh, back in court. Um, I know that Browner has strongly, uh, strongly advocated for a move to a defined contribution system. Um, and I know that he has uh, kind of vehemently said that Senate Bill 1 didn't go nearly far enough. Uh, I don't think there's, and I may be projecting my own preferences here too much, but I don't think there's the 
appetite in the legislature to do this uh, defined contribution transition. Uh, and so I could imagine a very significant stalemate if the, if the results from the court were A, this approach was unconstitutional, so doing yet more of that is a non-starter, and B, you know, there would be this fight about the defined contribution. So I can't read what would happen. It, it could conceivably be a stalemate that would result in nothing, or it could be, um, well, I think to be, honest, to be honest, it would depend on uh, where around or rank that is priorities. I think if you were to say, you know, I'm not going to sign a budget until I get XYZ on pensions, the conversation could conceivably change, but it would probably take that level of credible threat uh, to move the conversation. That's my guess. Senator Brady? That's a great question. Let me, um, let me just set the stage. It's my belief that if Governor Quinn is elected, we will continue to see one party rule. And they'll, so but the presumption under my answer is that you're going to see the Democrats do whatever they can do without Republican support. But if, Rahner, if Bruce Rahner is elected governor, I think you're going to see a lot more cooperation in anything the Democrats support, who will be in the majority, will require Republican support. So you got really two very diverse. Again, if Quinn's elected, the Democrats are going to rule probably without Republican input as they have for the last 12 years. And if Bruce Rauner's elected, we're going to see a bipartisan type of government because the Democrats are going to say, yeah, we'll help you, but you've got to have Republican support for some of these issues. I think history proves that that's the way this works. If Governor Quinn's elected, I think you're going to see a heavy emphasis on two things. I think there will be a heavy emphasis to tax retirement benefits. If they do that, they'll do that with solely Democratic support. I think that would be devastating to our state. I think you'll also see, and that's the way they'll deal with annuitants, and then I think you'll see they'll deal with current employees by saying you cannot receive a pay raise unless you agree to a reduction in your pension benefit, which is much of what Senator Culleton has outlined, and, and he believes to be constitutional. It's offered acceptance, consideration. So I think under Quinn administration, those are the two things you'll see pushed strongly by the Democrats, and I don't think you'll see much Republican support for either one of those. If Bruce Rauner's elected governor, I think that Governor Rauner would bring a bipartisan solution that probably would protect the interest that everyone's earned to date under the court ruling, uh, but move toward at least an optional type of defined contribution program uh, prospectively. Uh, now, I know as soon as I say this, Governor Quinn's going to uh, if someone asks him, he'll say, I would never tax retirement benefits because that's politically expedient. But also remind you, he promised people he wouldn't increase income taxes more than 1% when he ran against me. And lo and behold, we had a 2% increase. So I, I think we question uh, Governor Quinn's memory, at least, on tax commitments. Thank you. Uh, there is uh, concern on the part of a number of people about uh, amorti amortizing the the debt, the pension debt. Uh, we have the 95 law, and that law has failed, basically. How can we be sure that we can put into place another law that will indeed be followed by future legislators? Now, I, you've already addressed that. We can't compel future legislators outside of a, uh, what, a constitutional amendment. Would a constitutional amendment be practical? I don't think so, to be honest. I, I think that um, the public mood out there is not good on, on anything regarding state government. It sounds like an obligation. So I think if you ask the public to pass a referendum enacting a constitutional amendment, creating what sounds like a new pension-related obligation, it would be very hard to pass. Though I agree with Bill, it's the right thing, and I wish our Constitution had said that not only in 1971 when it was rewritten, but in, 19, you know, in the late 40s when the practice of underfunding pensions really, really uh, has its, its first history. Um, I think that short of that, uh, you can write more or less into the law to help, and we all just need to be vigilant, you know. Um, you should, uh, you know, SUA is here and they, they are a political organization. I think they do candidate questionnaires. And 
Maybe their candidate questionnaire should, should have uh, very few questions. And the first one should be, will you pledge to vote against any budget that doesn't fund the pension system? Uh, you know, I think there's, there's ways to apply political pressure. They're real. We, we screw up. We fail. And sometimes those who ought to apply political pressure don't apply as much as they might. But political pressure is real and can be applied and can, can make a real difference in that process. I also want to just quickly say about the amortization. Um, you know, Amanda's point about the flat payment schedule is, you know, a flat mortgage is, it's awesome, right? Because hopefully you get a little bit of a raise over time and so you're, it gets easier and easier to pay your mortgage and then one day you pay it all off and it just got a lot easier. And it, I mean, there's, there's a pleasantness to that if you can afford it on the front end and the, you know, it's partially a creature of kind of intense federal regulation, but the banks also like it because more of the debt gets paid down early than if it were to increase over time, and that increases the security of their investment as well. Uh, the current system that we have, I'm not talking about the 95 ramp as it existed in 95 and 98 and 2004 and 2007. I'm talking about the current system that we have and the other systems we've contemplated are based upon not an arbitrary balloon in, but rather a level percentage of payroll. The idea is to say, you know, as payroll increases as a result of inflation and raises and changes of headcount, let's simply allow the payment of the pension, uh, payment into the pension to track that uh, increase on a percentage basis. And it's, it's, it results in less payment on the front end than a level payment. There's no question. But it is, it is rational and it ties the pension payment to other anticipated areas of government growth. And, uh, typically, if you put yourself on a 30-year or less level percentage of payroll ramp and you actually make the payments, uh, things will turn out uh, pretty reasonably. Ms. Cash. So I disagree with Senator Biss on kind of the usage of the level percent of pay. He's, he's right in that it's kind of rationally designed, but a key part of it, right, is that it presumes that salary increases will occur. And unfortunately, Ray, what we've seen is that salary increases haven't been occurring, and we've also seen a decrease in the number of workers. So if you look at the growth in the unfunded liability, actually, over 1985 through 2013, and you look at the, the different factors of what contributed to the growth, states um, under-contributing, the investment returns, those kinds of things, Salary increases is actually a negative number, and that's because salaries haven't been growing. So this level percentage of pay really only works if we also have this kind of increase in salary um, that actually is kind of built into their model. The other thing I wanted to kind of just touch back on is this idea of how, how do we get the state to properly fund the pension systems? And I think, you know, while we're probably not going to have a constitutional amendment occur, if we kind of fix these two things together, right, of addressing how we pay for our, the pensions with changes to the revenue system, that, that's what hasn't been happening, and that's kind of how we fix it. Right? The state needs the adequate amount of revenue to pay for the debt owed to the pension systems, as well as cover the cost of these core services that you know, we all as citizens really demand for higher ed, health care, human services. Thank you. Uh, here are some questions that are taken from the SUA questionnaire. Uh, specifically, Senators, do you support the extension of the 5% income tax? Yes or no? If the options are current tax law or extend the 5% income tax, I strongly support the extension of the income tax. Thank you. Senator? Uh, if the options are, I strongly oppose the extension of 5%. And let me, let me just say this. Look, I want to go back to one thing. I'd like to be more optimistic and think we could have a constitutional amendment on requiring the legislature to fund pensions. There's no reason the legislature couldn't adopt a resolution that would put on the ballot at the very next election the question of whether or not our Constitution should require it. And we should. We should all ask for that. We should demand it, frankly. And we should be optimistic about its passage. Uh, and, and so I, I, I disagree somewhat with my colleagues about the opportunity there, particularly if this legislation, and even if this legislation is held constitutional, it should happen. We should bring the requirement of fiscal integrity to the legislature in the state of Illinois 
regardless. Um, again, my reason for not supporting a extension of the income tax is several fold, but it's primarily the same reason I don't support a tax on retirement income. It's been proven that that drives people out of Illinois. And the more people we lose, the more revenue, frankly, we lose. Because when we lose them, we not only lose their income tax, we lose their property tax, their sales tax, their utility taxes, and all the other things that make this government work. And we can't afford to continue to see this dramatic out-migration. And we know that Illinois is one of the largest net income losers, not only out migration, net income losers in this nation. And it's because of our tax policy. Could I pin you down a little bit more on that? Would you support uh, income? You pin in, down more. <laughs> would you support an income tax above a certain level of pension income? And would, if so, do you think it would be constitutional? I don't think. I, I, I think it would be constitutional. I think we fear that it would be constitutional. Uh, but no, I wouldn't support it because I believe it has a negative effect. Even say if you have an exemption of $50,000? I, I believe that if you're $50,000, uh, let, let's say another $50,000 is, is $2,500. If we lose that $2,500, I mean, if we lose that individual, we're going to lose a lot more than $2,500 in property, sales, utility, and other taxes that they currently pay, and the vibrance they bring to our economy. So I think on economic grounds, I oppose it because I think it's more costly than beneficial. Okay, thank you. Senator Biss, do you, do you mind if I, I don't Go ahead. Screw everything up, but I, 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 Senator Brady's made this point a few times, and I have a lot of respect and great friends, but I just want to address this, this point head on of revenue loss associated with tax policy. A few, a few kind of points of agreement. Taxes should be levied with care, with concern, for good reason, because of necessity. They are sometimes difficult for people to bear. And they can have, and should be expected to have, at least some real economic consequences. But two things. First of all, the steps needed in order to address a fiscal problem all should be expected to have negative economic consequences. If you're putting less money into the state via programmatic spending, that should be expected to have the same kind of negative economic consequences as if you're taking it out via taxes. So that, that's the first point. And the second point is that, again, that we need to be cautious of what the impact of the taxation would be. But let's actually look at our tax code when we're presented with the argument that an increase in taxation might result in an actual decrease in revenue. Not with the argument that it's a bad idea or that it's unfair or that it's not worth it. Those are different arguments. But with the argument that it might actually result in a decrease in revenue. When the state moved its tax rate from 3 to 5%, and there was some uh, perhaps uh, resulting economic impact, states' income tax receipts still grew by more than 67%. And the reason is that even no matter how strong you, block, you buy into this art lab for supply side stuff, the tax rate went up 67%, as those who oppose it are very happy to remind us. In order to result in a decrease in revenue when you're bumping up the tax rate 67%, it would have been necessary for economic activity or employment to drop 40%. If you imagine two out of every five jobs disappearing like this because of a 2% tax rate in the state income tax when federal income taxes are by far the most significant portion of everyone's, everyone's tax burden, it's not plausible. It didn't happen. You might argue there's a negative economic impact. You cannot possibly argue it didn't massively increase revenue. And if you look at states like Kansas that are trying to reverse, trying dramatic tax cuts to goose economic activity and allegedly goose revenues, they found it does not work. Again, you've got to be careful about taxes. You need to be cautious about it and responsible about it. But the idea that given the interplay between federal and state tax codes, a modest change in the state tax level will cause such a huge behavior impact that it will result in less revenue, it's just not conceivable. It does not happen. Senator Brady, we're clearly 
revenues increased. I'm not arguing that. That's, that's, that's clear. But the unintended consequences and the purported solution didn't occur. You know, the Democrats under Governor Quinn raised taxes 67%, as you said, 2% uh, increase over the three, with the purported interest that they were going to pay down the debt. Now, our moderator opened the discussion by saying they have over $5.1 billion in unfunded, unpaid bills. Uh, we have more debt than we had before. In terms, if you add up pension obligations and all together, the state has more liabilities than it had before the tax increase. Uh, and then, if you look at the unintended consequences of one of the most lagging states in job performance, 200,000 fewer jobs, and you look at the fact that we're the single largest, practically the single largest net out migration state in the nation. These are the things that build a sustainable economy. Mathematically, everyone would agree with you that raising the tax rate 67% brought more money into government. But did it pay down unpaid bills? No. Did it foster job creation? No. Uh, did it reduce the out migration in the state? No. Those are the consequences that our economy bears the burden of, and people who are unemployed bear the burden of, uh, that were determined by that huge increase in government revenue. Uh, is there any support for a sales tax on services among you? Whichever, whoever. We know who supports it. <laughs> Like well, let me just say, say something. I'll, I'll start. Say yes, no. I think the first place you've got to get, as I've said before, and, and most people know I'm a tax hawk. If you didn't, talk to me later. But but um, right now, there's a lot of money left on the table from people who are now avoiding sales taxes on things that we should be collecting them under the current law. So I think the first area you've got to resolve is how do we get the taxes that we should be getting that we are no longer getting. I think there's a place for it in the discussion. I think that generally speaking, you want taxes to be as broad as possible so you can lower rates. And I think that you want the tax code to pick up the area of economic growth, which for better or for worse has typically been services in the last few decades. I also think you need to be careful about the distributional impacts, though. And so I don't, I don't want to give a blanket yes answer until I see the details. There are, there are literally hundreds of different categories of sales, taxes, one could levy. And I, I think you need to be very, very, very cautious in which ones to use and what rates to use to make sure that you're not doing something truly regressive. I just want to touch on sales tax expansion. Um, also, my organization has kind of been hammering away right, for, I don't even know how long, about expanding the sales tax base. And I think one thing that's important is that if we expand the sales tax base, that doesn't just benefit the state, but that also benefits local governments, right? So we've got places like Chicago that have their own, um, through the being home rule, have their own sales tax rate that's on top. So if you expand the sales tax base, that's more money into the state as well as local governments, which can be extremely helpful for them in dealing with their own um, unfunded pension liabilities. Thank you very much. I think we're going to call the uh, panel to a close now. Thank you all for attending. Thank you to our panelists for making it a very useful uh, and informative session for all of us. And thank you for those of you out on the web for watching.